my name is Hank Levine. I'm president and CEO of iPlace USA. Hank, thanks so much for making time to join us on the IV podcast on this uh, Monday morning. I appreciate you making time before we jump in and talk all the great stuff about iPlace and all the things that you're building as part of your, your company. Give us a thumbnail version of your career prior to that. Uh, my, <laughs> my career prior to, to that is maybe interesting, maybe a mess. I've reinvented myself several times right out of college. I uh, did uh, thermonuclear fusion research for a company in California. Then I went back to business school. I worked in home automation for about a decade and uh, at the real bleeding edge, but working on some real cool technology in, in the 80s. Uh, then in the 90s, I worked for several venture capital backed software companies. And then it was only uh, in the last you know, 15, 16 years where I started getting involved in India and working in the recruiting industry. Well, that's super exciting. Definitely a very diverse background. So fast forward to 2006, where I believe is the year of, of birth of iPlace. Uh, tell us a little bit more about iPlace and more you're also interested in what, what led you to, to building such a company that provides, you know, those particular services. Was there a particular story or a gap that you saw in the industry? Just talk a little bit from that perspective as well. Yeah, you know, I really didn't have plans to get into the recruiting industry. As I mentioned, I was working with several venture capital backed software companies. I was starting to work in, in recruiting. I didn't I meet some people who had some good connections with the recruiting companies and we started providing recruiters for them and that's how I got involved. Well, that's very interesting and thanks for thanks for that insight. And based on um, kind of everything that I know about iPlace, and correct me if I, if I got my numbers wrong, um, I believe you have over 700 recruiters in India and over 100 clients and which places, I guess iPlace is one of the largest recruiting companies that, uh, you know, me personally have come across in the past. And I would imagine that, you know, it's, it's not a small feat to manage an organization of that size, especially virtually, especially remotely in different uh, geographical locations. Uh, just talk a little bit more from that perspective. How do you manage the organization overall? And what are the just uh, some of the strategies that you deploy? Okay, so I'm going to just step back a, a little bit and explain the nature of our company. So we're not a staffing firm. Uh, we provide outsource recruiters. So by that, I mean, we have recruiters who are dedicated to our clients and work for them on a full-time basis by augmenting their talent acquisition team. So our recruiters do essentially the same thing our clients' talent acquisitions team do. And our clients are both corporations and and staffing firms. So you're right, when you have a, you know, 700 recruiters spread out over 100 clients operationally, it, it is a big task. Fortunately, we have a fantastic management team in India. Our team has been with us, almost without exception, for at least 10 years. So they're quite experienced and they understand the company and, and our culture. But we also have a really, really cool secret weapon. It's called a Launchpad. And the basis of Launchpad is gamification. So, we, so Launchpad is essentially our company operating system. The whole company runs off it. It was invented by the team in India. It's run by the team in India. And as I said, it really supercharges performance. Well, that's very interesting. And anytime I hear gamification, uh, I get super excited because coming from a highly technical background myself, it, I always saw value in um, in adding components that add some type of gamification to whether it's a complex process or how do you measure teams' performance and things like that. So tell us a little bit more about the, the launch pad and the gamification aspect of that. How do you utilize that as part of the recruiting service? Yeah, people are pretty familiar with gamification because just about everyone's gamified today. You know, we're all collecting airline and hotel miles or, or Starbucks points and so forth. But, uh, but we're really one of the only companies who have gamified our operations. So the, the way this works is uh, every, every month our 
recruiting managers meet with our point of contact at each one of our clients. And in those meetings, they set team goals for, for each of the, for uh, the entire team. And then the manager goes back and sets individual goals for each one of the recruiters on the team. We also do a, a monthly uh, performance review with each client and we set, uh, I'm sorry, I meant quarterly performance review. And we set quarterly goals for the team in, in that meeting. So uh, what it comes down to is that every recruiter has goals for the, each month and goals for each quarter. So that's very interesting. And you've mentioned that you, as iPlace collaborates with, with your clients in terms of setting these monthly and quarterly goals. How, how does that, you know, how, how does the, the gaming part of, of it actually works? Give us maybe some more concrete examples from that standpoint. Okay, so the way it works is when a recruiter achieves a goal, he or she earns stars. And when you get 40 stars, you get an automatic pay raise. And when you get 120 stars, you get an automatic promotion. So we don't have any performance reviews in the companies. The recruiter success, how quickly they get pay raises, how quickly they advance is all dependent on how quickly they earn stars. Well, let me... Let me let me take this back a little bit. I believe I heard you said we have no performance reviews at the company. So let me double click on that a little bit further. What exactly do you mean? Because it just sounds, you know, just sounds too good to be true to have no performance reviews. Uh, it, it is too good to be true. So I think I think everybody hates performance reviews. It's if you go into the internet and just you know Google that, you'll just see thousands of articles about how people hate performance reviews. We were no different. Uh, our, our managers hated them, our re recruiters hated them. And the reasons people hate them are, are very, uh, they you know, tend to take up an enormous amount of time. I mean, our managers were probably spending 30, 40% of their time just preparing for performance reviews, right? They had a lot of recruiters. Uh, of course, you know, there's other problems with bias. A lot of times the review you get isn't, doesn't have too much to do with how good a recruiter you are. It has to do with how much your manager likes you. There's a lot of recency bias. You tend to remember things that are recent and forget things that the recruiter might have accomplished nine months ago. You know, these conversations become very counterproductive. You wanna have a conversation, a performance review about how to improve performance, but they usually get sidetracked when you talk about a compensation. In fact, we found that um, after performance reviews was our point of highest attrition in the company because people were resentful or they saw what other people were getting and they felt it wasn't fair. And so the, so the whole system of performance reviews was very bad. Uh, the, the cool thing is with Launchpad, it all went away. It went away 100%. I, um, no one even mentions performance reviews or appraisals or any of those things. They know that to get ahead in the company, you achieve your goals, you achieve them every day, you achieve them every month, you achieve them every quarter. And if you produce, you get pay raises and promotions. If you don't produce, you don't get ahead. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate on so many levels because I've, I've managed teams of different size at you know a fortune 500 corporate environment as well as the startups of my own companies and performance reviews it's it's a it's a dreadful exercise and as they say i recently listened to a conversation by the president of coinbase and she spoke a lot on uh, you know the performance reviews there's analogy of you know horses smell fear and at the end of the day when when you get into that performance review environment and it always starts with some type of a small talk that you know here's some little things that you do you do well but there's always that but. Uh, and as you, as you spoke in, term, in terms of the, the fallacy of the performance reviews that it's, you know, tends to focus so much on what the recent, you know, the, I guess, accomplishments were or the missteps and overlook bypassing the, some of the previous accomplishments in the past. So overall, it just sounds very interesting. Curious to, to get your thoughts on what do your clients actually think about the launch pad, that this approach and what value do they get out of this? 
uh, our, our clients absolutely love it um, because for the recruiters to get stars, they need to do exactly what the client wants them to do. All right, so each account's different and they have, and we have different goals for each recruiter, but basically the recruiter is earning stars and they're highly, highly motivated to earn stars because that's how they get pay raises and promotions. So if they get stars, they're doing exactly what the client wants them to do. That's very interesting. And to look at it from a different lens, from the other side of the spectrum, from the recruiter standpoint, what do you think is their perception of the launch pads? Um, you know, as you manage that partnership with your client and just overall collaboration on the goal setting, um, how does the recruiter feedback come into the place? What, what's overall perception from the recruiter side? Well, we, we've done uh, surveys of our, of our recruiters. And so, you know, this is both anecdotal, but it's also in, in, in data. And our recruiters love a Launchpad. And what they love about it is it puts pay raises and promotions in their hands. So in most cases, if you're not getting your stars, the solution's very simple. You just work harder. So I'll give you an example. Say a recruiter will earn stars if she gets 30 send outs in a month. And now it's coming towards the end of the month, she's only at 24. So she's gonna really need to pick it up to get the 30. Well, how does she do that? It's pretty simple. She stretches her hours. Maybe she works on the weekend, but if she works hard enough, she can almost always get 30 stars. And it, Launchpad can be very lucrative for our recruiters. The best recruiters get four or five pay raises in a year. And so each pay raise isn't huge, but cumulatively they are huge. So our, our employees are very well paid, but they're only well paid if they earn it, right? If they're creating value for I place in the client, they, they move up fast and they get big pay raises. Right, right, right. Very, very interesting. And I would imagine that also puts a lot of pressure on recruiters uh, because it's, it, you know, it's a metric driven approach, although it is gamified. But at the end of the day, how do, how do you manage that balance, you know, of that becoming too much pressure on the recruiters versus the actual performance? You know, well, that's, well, that's interesting. It, it, you know, it, it does hold them accountable. So that certainly does make pressure, but it's pretty interesting. We had a, um, a research study done by Lorenzo Benzi. He's a professor at Cal State Fullerton and he showed that you know, Launchpad dramatically increased engagement of our recruiters, but there were about 20% of our recruiters who didn't like it, mostly because they were being held accountable. But the fascinating thing was that it showed even the 20% who didn't like it judged the system to be very fair. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that was the most amazing part of all the data. I knew people liked it, but the ones who didn't like it still thought it was fair. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think fairness is a very, very, very strong yet of, oftentimes overlooked component of, you know, just doing business overall in general, whether that's, you know, if we talk about performance measurement or any type of goal setting, I think fairness is, is definitely um, a very strong component of any of that type of strategy. Yeah, um, I, I place, um, you know, we, we really believe in transparency. So Launchpad really helps us deliver that too. So, uh, Launchpad is on our, our corporate intranet. You can see how each recruiter in the company is doing, how close he or she is to getting a pay raise or a promotion. It's, it's all public information. So that also you know, really keeps people on their toes because of course no one wants to be at the you know, bottom of the, of the pack amongst their peers. But, um, you know, the, the people who are leading the, the way are really cleaning up and that's nice to be able to show too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would imagine that. So how, how, do, how do personal goals fit into the, the overall gamification aspect of that? I understand the professional side, the metrics in terms of the actual performance, but I would imagine the, you know, personal goals also, you know, uh, make up a good portion of just the overall formula. How do you go about that? Talk a little bit more from that perspective. Yeah, well, the, the monthly and the quarterly game is actually quite different in nature. 
the monthly game tends to be based on things where you can get quick results on a daily basis, weekly basis, or certainly on a monthly basis. So it would be things like a call activity, number of send downs, number of interviews a recruiter's getting. And uh, as I mentioned, it's different for experienced and, and less experienced recruiters. So a less experienced recruiter would be very production based. An experienced recruiter will have goals for the team because we want the we want the experienced recruiters to coach the other members of their team. So it might be production of the whole team. Um, in the quarterly game, we focus on things that take a little bit longer. So things that you can't do in a week. Uh, we almost always have uh, placement goals. Placements usually take a month or two to, to get a, an actual placement. But we also have goals that are really cool around health and well-being. So one thing we have is a professional development goal. So we have a, a very, very good learning management system. It's called iPlace Academy. There's close to 300 courses in it. And these courses are in groups. So uh, recruiters will be assigned a area. It might be uh, just getting expertise on an industry or a technology or a type of sourcing technique. But if they complete a number of modules and they get certified in a particular area, they can earn stars for that. And then the coolest thing we have is we set monthly goals around health and well being. So every recruiter has something that they need to achieve for health and well being in, in the quarter. It could be reading a business book, it could be losing weight, it could be quitting smoking. Uh, we've even done this for reducing credit card debt. And uh, if you do that, you, 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 get, you get stars. In fact, we're even, uh, we're even giving stars out for uh, getting vaccinated against COVID. <laughs> that's, very, that's, very, that's definitely a very creative approach. And I would imagine that's, you know, increases the engagement overall from some of the company objectives that you set. Uh, I, I was amazed at how much that increased engagement. Um, you know, when we first put this in, it was before COVID when I was coming to India regularly. And when we first started doing things for health and wellness, at least five people came up to me and they said, this is so great that the company's doing this. It shows that you care about us as people and everything else in Launchpad is around production, but this is, this is around me and making me a better person. And it was just really, really nice to hear. Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely imagine that. And besides improving and increasing the productivity of the recruiters, um, talk about other advantages of such approach of gamification, but also maybe highlight some of the disadvantages as well that you may have observed. Well, so I would say some of the other big advantages is it really frees up management time. So, you know, so instead of spending all their time doing performance review, it focuses the managers on achieving specific goals that the clients have identified are important to them. So they you know, get a lot of coaching. Uh, they're meeting with, with each recruiter every month, talking about their goals. And so it really just focuses on the managers, not on the minutia of people positioning to get pay raises, but on you know, what you need to produce. Um, I would say another thing it's been great for is technology adoption. So I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you probably my favorite example. So we use an aggregator tool called Daxtra. It's a very, very good a tool. It allows you to put one search string in the Daxtra and it'll go out to six job boards simultaneously and pull back all the candidates. So it should save a recruiter quite a bit of time because you don't have to go from job board to job board to job board. Now, when we first put a Daxtra in, it was about five or six years ago. And much to our surprise, we thought our recruiters would love it because it would make them more productive but a lot of them didn't want to use it. And they came up with excuses such as, it's a new interface, I'm not getting as good as results as I do when I search individually. And all of these things weren't actually true, they were just excuses. So the adoption initially was, was pretty low. What we did is we, we put in the adoption of Daxtra as a monthly goal for every recruiter in the company and overnight adoption went to 100%. So it, 
it's you know there's a lot, there's a lot of you know, very good, good things you can do uh, th through gamification, uh, not just in you know, direct production, but around you know technology adoption and other things. I would say you know maybe the only drawback is that it you know it, it does keep the pressure up, but I don't think that's bad. You know we you know recruiting is ultimately a, a sales occupation. Our clients pay us to produce, they pay us to get placements and people should be working hard every day, you know, every day that they're built out to a client. Right, exactly. That's exactly, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you sign up for, whether you're a recruiter, whether you're running an organization as such, a sales driven performance metrics as such, definitely make up, you know, at the core of the strategy of successful collaboration with your clients. So Hank, you've been in talent acquisition, recruiting that whole space for quite some time. You've seen the industry go through all different iterations, um, you know, very cyclical motions. Tell us a little bit more about some of the trends that you mostly excited about these days, whether, whether that's in your particular space or just overall on the hiring and recruiting. Just talk a little bit more from, you know, what are you currently researching? Well, we, we have a pretty big program in our company where we're looking at all the different technologies that are in the recruiting space, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. Uh, right now, at, at iPlace, we work almost exclusively in professional recruiting, so those are jobs in IT, engineering, healthcare, finance, accounting, marketing, and sales. We haven't done much work in uh, lower paid jobs or in countries that have a lower labor cost. And the reason for that is, is pretty simple. Those jobs, you know, they don't pay a lot of money. They, they, they won't pay uh, our recruiters much money to work on them and to support uh, lower paid jobs and to work in lower labor cost markets, you have to have a recruiting approach that's very, very technology driven. So we are actually in the process now of implementing a lot of technologies uh, from going out and reaching candidates, getting them without any human touch to apply to jobs, you know, working with, with chatbots and AIs, and then just having recruiters do a more cursory interview for mass hiring projects. And uh, you know, we just started working on a few of our first projects now. We think that can be a big expansion for us. Right, that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, when it comes to with the, the current state of the market, such a candidate driven um, environment, so overall, we, we experienced that on so many levels uh, with the war on retention, war on, you know, just war on the talent acquisition overall, just so much, you know, so much light is being shot on just share some thoughts on that. How do some companies succeed in that space? And also, you being also the strategic consultant for your clients, what are some of the strategies or practical recommendations that you provide to your clients when it comes to winning the war on retention, just winning the war on talent? Yeah, well, I think it comes down to, you know, recruiting is supposed to be a, a you know, very personal high touch activity. But I think in the past when, when it was, not a candidate market, but a buyer's market, you know, recruiters oftentimes don't treat the candidates very well. And, uh, you know, we, we have both recruiters and account managers and account managers try to give the white glove treatment to, to the candidates. So, uh, you know, we, we stay in touch with them. Uh, if they're not getting feedback right away, we tell them why, we tell them what to expect. We try to prep them well for an interview and we just try to make them feel, you know, smart, important and valued. And I would, you know, be critical of the recruiting industry. I don't think, especially in the staffing world, and a lot of recruiters, you know, probably don't make candidates feel smart, important, and valued. And, but, you know, we're focusing very hard on that. I think that's the key to um, making, you know, I, I know that all recruiting companies are seeing a lot more drop-offs of candidates, right? Candidates get offers, but they don't start. And, and I think making the candidates feel smart, important, and valued is, is the key to getting the, those uh, conversions as high as possible. There's an there's a area that I'm, I'm fascinated by because of how complex it is and very difficult to master. And I'm talking about interview. And when it comes, you know, 
from past experience, I've been on both sides. So I'm, I'm with, you know, I'm in the talent acquisition, recruiting, staffing, technology space these days, but I've been on the hiring side as part of the, you know, the corporate sector. So I understand that, you know, from the interview standpoint, a lot of the emphasis, at least from what I've observed, is too much on that personal past experience and versus focusing on some of the strengths that are missing on my team. And, you know, a lot of hiring managers just focus more a little bit on what are the weaknesses that I can tolerate in their particular candidate. And let me make some decisions based on that. Tell us a little bit more about your thoughts, your strategies on just prepping for the interview. How do you go about managing and setting those expectations when it comes to both the recruiter candidate and the hiring manager side? What helps you improve, kind of increase that batting average? Yeah, I, we do We do a lot of things in that regard. Um, first thing is we try to work very closely with hiring managers. So a lot of hiring managers, they're good at their job, but they're not very good at creating job orders. And they tend to create a wish list of everything they want. In this market, you're probably not going to get that. But also in this market, any market, some of those things might not matter. For example, you'll see uh, hiring managers for a developer position will put down something like must have gone to a you know top top university in engineering or computer science and so we'll say to that hiring manager if i found someone that maybe didn't go to college but she's worked for 15 years as a developer she's great at coding she's you know has all these accomplishments but she doesn't have a college degree would you hire her and the hiring manager almost without exception says of course so when they say, of course, you say, then why is this, you know, you know, if I send this to my recruiter, they're only going to look for people from top universities. You know, let's, let's, re let's remove that. Um, so th as far as uh, prepping candidates go, this actually comes out of our professional development department. So we have a checklist of things that we go over with them, but we also have three very, very good videos. And they're about 20 minutes long. So it does take some work on the part of the candidate, but it teaches the candidate everything they need to prep for an in-person interview, for a video interview, or a phone interview. And I, I think it's one of the nicest piece of work that our professional development department does. So before, you know, we encourage our candidates very aggressively to put them together. Um, one of the most important things that candidates can do to get jobs is to prepare um, what we call these cars, where you talk about you know, a specific challenge that you had, the action that you took, and, and the result. You need, to, you need to boil that down to like 30 seconds, but people remember stories. So, so what we try to get our candidates to say in an interview, if the hiring manager is not very good at interviewing, they can say, well, you know, I had an experience that was very challenging. Would you like to hear about it? And the hiring manager always says yes. And then they just deliver, you know, just, just what I told you, the car, the challenge, the action, the result. And hiring managers remember that and they hire them. Right. Right, absolutely. So to take that a little bit further, what, what are some of your personal go-to interview questions when you interview folks for your own teams? Um, how do you structure structure your own interviews? And more importantly, what do you look for in the responses when you when you hear them? Well, all right. So remember the recruiters we're hiring, we're hiring people in India. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a somewhat uh, you know different different game over there. And um, so you know we we look for uh, longevity. You know, we ask a lot of questions about values. Which I don't think the other recruiting companies ask, but we have uh, our core values. It's very important that 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 people believe in them. We want to find people who believe in them before they join the company, and uh, we and we look for a record of accomplishment. Uh, but I will tell you that in the last couple of years, we started emphasizing, you know, much more focus on recruiters who had a lot of experience. Uh, for many of our early years, we tried to develop newer people to be recruiters, and we found that they just didn't perform nearly as well as when we uh, try to recruit people 
with a lot of experience. Uh, we're very fortunate that we have a spectacular good reputation in India and everyone wants to work for us. So, uh, you know, we can go to the other large recruiting companies and the recruiters are generally eager to jump to us. In fact, India is um, India is going through the, the great resignation, much like the United States is, and there's massive turnover in recruiting companies. But in I place, our attrition has actually gone down a little over the last year. Very, very insightful. And from a globalization perspective, it's just very interesting to observe how the different geographical areas go through very similar problems, very similar challenges when it comes to just overall talent acquisition, because with the pandemic and everything being so lifted when it comes to just the virtual environments is just, it's, it's so much opportunity, but at the same time, a lot of lessons learned uh, as, as we come out of, I guess, that particular period. Um, Hank, the last segment of each podcast is kind of the heat check where I ask a question and, you know, you provide a more immediate answer. Um, what, what, what's your content diet looking like these days? What are some of the sources that you consume on a daily basis to keep yourself informed on all the things going on in your industry? Well, um, of course, I, I read all the research reports from staff and industry analysts because I think they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, I also love to read the blog post from a from a sales organization that's focused on staffing called called Butler Street. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the two things that I you know read the most. I I'm on all the bulletin boards for ASA and TechServe also, so I you know do keep up with that. But in general, I think that uh, you know most of my reading isn't on the recruiting industry. It's more you know general business reading. That makes perfect sense. And take that a little bit further. When it comes to books, I always ask, you know, each guest on the podcast episode is, what are you currently reading? And is there one book that you always recommend to others? And why is that? Right now, uh, well, there's, there's about 10 books I recommend to, to others, but I'm, you're putting me on the spot and a lot, lot of pressure. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the things I used to, you know, I used to, before the pandemic, I would go to India four times a year. And mm -hmm. so I would always read two books, one on the airplane there and one on the airplane back. And I have to confess that in the uh, last 18 months or so, about my trips to India, I haven't been reading, reading books as much, which is a very bad thing to, to say in a podcast. But it would be true because when I lose my long airplane ride, I sort of lost that. Oh, that makes perfect sense. And it, it's it's a different world that we all live in, especially, you know, what we used to do before we had to make a lot of adjustments. So I can definitely relate on so many levels. Um, Hank, I can't thank you enough for your time today. It was very short and insightful conversation. Personally learned quite a bit. What I love doing with all the podcast guests is do a follow-up recording in about a year where we revisit the conversation from a year ago and see if everything that we've discussed still makes sense, still applies. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that with you as well. All right, well, thank you. This was really fun and that will be really cool to do this in a year. I'm curious to see you know, what I learned from that too. <laughs> Thanks so much, Hank. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.